So welcome to chapter 17 of the story. I appreciate you joining us here at Kennebecasis or kbconline.ca. And again, I look forward to March 14th and uh, rejoining you here in this place. Uh, so we'll, again, we'll have um, the information for how to sign up for that um, online. And we'll get that out probably this Monday because I know there will be a bunch of you that are willing, wanting to sign up pretty early. Again, we've been going through the story as a church family, and, um, you know, it's been an exciting journey. There's 31 chapters in the story, and it takes us through the entire scripture in, in pieces and just helps us understand the history and, and then, again, the salvation work of Jesus Christ. And last week, we were on the Assyrian invasion of Judah and Israel and how Hezekiah staved off uh, the Assyrian um, you know, uh, uh, exile, and was able to, um, you know, stave off God's anger, as we'll talk about today. So I want you to turn to page 243 of this story, The Kingdom's Fall. And I'm going to actually read something near the end of um, the chapter and really begin to help you understand where they ended up um, through um, and why they ended up in this place. So page 243 or 2 Kings chapter 25 says these words. Then the city, this is verse 4, page 242, uh, bottom of 242. Then the city wall was broken through and the whole army fled at night through the gate between the two walls near the king's garden. Through the Bab Though the Babylonians were surrounding the city, they fled towards Arab, Ar Araba. But the Babylonian army pursued the king and overtook him in the plains of Jericho. All his soldiers were separated from him and scattered, and he was captured. He was taken to the king of Babylon at Riblah, where sentence was pronounced on him. They killed the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes, then they put out his eyes, bound him with bronze shackles, and took him to Babylon. On the seventh day of the fifth month, in the nineteenth year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, commander of the imperial guard, an official of the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem. He set fire to the temple of the Lord, the royal palace, and all the houses of Jerusalem. Every important building he burned down. The whole Babylonian army under the commander of the imperial guard broke down the walls around Jerusalem. Nebuchadnezzar, the commander of the guard, carried into exile the people who remained in the city along with the rest of the population and those who had deserted to the king of Babylon. But the commander left behind some of the poorest people of the land to work the vineyards and the fields." I want to pray as I go into this message because this week, as I prepared for this message, was probably one of the hardest messages I have prepared for based on the conversation that God wants me to bring to the table. So let me pray right now for you as you listen. Father God, I know this conversation is one that needs to be had and often one that we, we as uh, human beings that believe in you struggle with. God, we're going to be talking about your anger and your wrath. And Father, even those two words make us just stand back and go, I don't want to believe in a God like that. I just want to believe in the God of love and compassion. God, so right now I need your voice to speak into my head and allow me to be clear about who you are as God. And that you are a just God, a caring God, a God who does bring wrath, but a God who through that wrath brings love in Jesus. In his name I pray. Amen. 
Amen. This is, um, again, a difficult message, and, and why I really wanted to start near the end is, is, I don't know if you watch these movies or not, these movies that start with what they call a frame story. Movies that start at the end of the movie and then cycle back to the start. You know the type of movies I'm talking about. Um, you know, how about this movie, for example? You know, do you want a chocolate? You know, I can eat about a million and a half of these. My mom always said life was like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. Those must be comfortable shoes. I bet you can walk in those shoes and not feel a thing. I wish I had shoes like that. Mom always said there's an awful lot you can tell about a person's shoes, where they're going, where they've been. I've worn lots of shoes. I bet if I think real hard, I can remember my first pair of shoes. Mama said they'd take me anywhere. She said they were my magic shoes. You remember that movie? Yeah, people are chuckling at me right now in this place, making fun of me. Forrest Gump, sitting at a bus stop, talking to a stranger. And he continues the story and keeps talking and talking and talking. You know, the writers of Forrest Gump use what they can call a frame story. It begins the end and, and moves into a flashback to tell how the characters got to where they're at and eventually joins back up where the story moves past this frame story. You know, movies like Shelley's Frankenstein or, you remember Titanic? Yeah, going back to last week in chapter 16, we see the exile of the southern kingdom was staved off, staved off by a U-turn by Hezekiah. We talked last week about how each of us need to or go down a road that we're not really wanting to go down. And nor does God want us to go down this road. And we talked about the need for us to make a U-turn in life and how we are authorized to do so in the name of Jesus Christ and the sacrifice on the cross. Near the end of Hezekiah's life, he became ill and was at the point of death. But he cried out to God, and, and in tears, he says, you know, God, I need you to deliver me from this. And God promised him in this 15 more years. But with that promise came a prophecy that I want to read from 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 16 to 18. And this comes get back from the chapter 16 as we go back to last week. Again, what we're trying to understand is how did we get here? How did we get to this place? Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord. The time will surely come when everything in your palace and all that your predecessors have stored up until this day will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. And some of your descendants, your own flesh and blood, will be born to you, will, who were born to you, will be taken away, and they will become eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. I talked a few weeks back about how God needs to hold true to both his prophecies and his promises. So let's see where chapter 17 leads us. Again, we're going through this lineage of kings for the last couple of chapters, and here we find ourselves in 716 B.C. with Hezekiah, who was a good king, and he finished good. You know, we continue with... Um, into 687 with Manasseh, and that's where we'll focus a lot of our story around. He was evil, but, but you know, near the end, he became good. And then Amon was evil and evil. Josiah, well, he was good and good. And, you know, really, as you read through chapter 17, I really want you to focus in on Josiah and see that story. I don't have a whole lot of time to go into Josiah today, but that's a great story. Jehoaz has, was evil and evil. Jehoiakim, evil, evil. I'm not even going to try to pronounce this guy's name. Evil and evil. Jehoiachin. I'll go with that. And then Zedekiah, the last king before the exile. Evil and evil. Hezekiah's story and the first king that we're going to be talking about, you know, as a U-turn, allowed him to um, be seen as a good king. 
But his son Manasseh continues the previous pattern of kings, which would be father not like son. Open your stories to page 231. Page 231 and the first page of this chapter. 231. It says these words. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king. And he reigned in Jerusalem 55 years. His mother's name was Hephzibah. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, following the detestable practices of the nations the Lord had driven out before the Israelites. He rebuilt the high places his father Hezekiah had destroyed. He also erected altars to Baal and made Asherah poles as Ahab, king of Israel, had done. He bowed down to the starry hosts and worshipped them. He built altars in the temple of the Lord, of which the Lord had said in Jerusalem, I'll put my name. In the two courts of the temple of the Lord, he built altars to all the starry hosts. He sacrificed his own son in the fire, practiced divination, sought omens, and consulted mediums and spiritists. And listen to this. He did much evil. In the eyes, so he did much evil in the eyes of the Lord, arousing his anger. If you drop down into page 232 near the end, or verse 15, it says these words, Because they have done evil in my eyes, the Lord says, and have provoked me to anger from the day their forefathers came out of Egypt until this day. They provoked God's anger. Here's my thought. From the day their forefathers came out of Egypt until this day. Three hundred years it has been since Exodus. And God speaks these words they have provoked, or as the story puts it, aroused my anger. The New Living Translation says, they have angered me. The CEV says, my people have done what I hate and have not stopped making me angry since their ancestors left Egypt. Eugene Peterson's message says this, they've been nothing but trouble to me from the day their ancestors left Egypt until now. They pushed me to my limit. I won't put up with their evil any longer. They have pushed me to my limit. Which leads me to the question, have you ever been pushed to that point? You know, that you were so angry that you could not control your response? Any dog owners out there? You know, I know, I've been looking at Facebook, I know Jeff and, and Sherry have been having a tough time with their, their pooch there. And you know, that, and you get the, that you're so angry that you can't sometimes control your response? You know, I have to admit that I had to learn to be a good dog owner. You know, I talked last week about, you know, my uh, first contact with my first dog. His name was Jerry and how he marked his territory. And I understand how there are times when you walk into the house after a time where your dog has been home alone and you walk in and you are driven or your anger is aroused. Walked in one time after, uh, you know, dropping the kids off at school and I'd come back and we had done a Starbucks order, or sorry, a Costco order uh, the day before and some stuff was still out on the counters, including a couple pounds of Starbucks coffee. Well, those weren't on the counter anymore when I got home. No, they were spread out all over the floor because, you know, Jerry said, you know, I, you know, my owner loves coffee. Maybe I should try it too. And he tried and he wanted to try it out, but it aroused my anger. Another time, you know, I bought the kids one of those jumbo boxes of Honey Nut Cheerios. You know the ones I'm talking about. Now I can just picture it. I've eaten Honey Nut Cheerios in my day, and you know, a bowl full, maybe two bowls, would make my stomach, you know, feel a little bloated. When I can't imagine a dog being able to chow through an entire box of Honey Nut Cheerios within the period of five minutes and how he would have felt, but I tell you what, it aroused my anger. And then there's this one time we had finished tiling our floor in our kitchen. And we had just finished grouting. And, and Jerry was a kennel dog. And so when, when we left, you know, 
because he became a kennel dog. Let's just say that after the Starbucks and the Honey Nut Cheerios, he became a kennel dog. And that's the way I would control my anger when I got home. I would just let him out of the, because he wasn't able to get up to much. But this one time, we had finished the tile flooring and we had just finished grouting and he was in his kennel. Well, when we got home, there was a certain odor in the house. We're not sure what he got into still to this day. But when he left the kennel and ran across the kitchen floor, there were certain things that were coming out of him that were landing right where the grout had just been recently laid. And it aroused my anger just a little bit. And you know, you know, I wonder sometimes, you know, how we're like those dogs. That we just can't control sometimes the things that we do. The word that two kings or second kings uses is this word called the vexed. Vexed. Vexed is a word that is used to talk about God's anger being aroused. You know, when I walked in and caught the smell of the dog on the newly grouted tile floor, my anger was vexed, or I was vexed, or to be angry, be vexed, be indignant, be wroth, be grieved, provoked to anger and wrath. This is the word, the root meaning of cause, this word is to vex, is to agitate, stir up, provoke the heart to heated conditions, which in turn leads to a specific action or actions. Key word here, specific action. Vexed leads to anger, or is anger stirred up, which leads to specific actions. And to be honest with you, I sat all week thinking about this. I would sit at my office desk, and I would just go, I don't want to talk about this. I just want this to, to blow over, and I don't want to explain this. Or, to be honest with you, maybe I want to explain it away. I, but I always want to see God as the loving God who does not get angry with his creation. But I struggled with this all week long, and I'd close my eyes, and I'd pray, God, you need to help me understand this. Quite a few years ago, there was a book that was brought out, a book called Love Wins. You know, and I struggled when I read this book. Because, again, this book, you know, kind of explains away God's anger. You know, I wouldn't really understand it, and I can understand it, this anger. And this author tries to explain away love wins with the idea that God's anger is is stifled and that in the end love wins. But, you know, I think about this story in the particulars and say God was vexed and he had to, again, go back to that word, have a specific action. And in this story, the specific action was the exile. He had to do something. And then I think about the flood, and I wonder about God's anger. And then I think about Sodom and Gomorrah, and again, I think about God's anger. And you, through the Old Testament, and we've read several of these stories as we read the story, God's anger is stirred up, and he does something. It's brought to a specific action. And two things I want to say about God's wrath. When God is vexed, God's wrath is just. Again, I want to say this. God's wrath or anger is just. 300 years this went on. Again, almost 300 years it says that they have stirred up my anger. You know, for me as a human being, it takes a moment in time for me to get vexed. Like my anger is stirred up quickly. He gives plenty of warning. And I tell you this. His wrath always comes out of a place of love. Page 232, or 2 Chronicles chapter 33, page 232. We're going to read verse 10, or just near the end of 232, the last paragraph. The Lord spoke to Manasseh and his people, and they paid no attention. So the Lord brought against them the army commanders of the king of Assyria, and who took Manasseh prisoner, put a hook in his nose, bound him with bronze shackles, and took him to Babylon. 
In his distress, he sought the favor of the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his ancestors. Let me help you understand this. God's anger was vexed. He did something to Manasseh. Again, that distinct uh, action that had to come out of the vexing. And the, and the Lord God did this. And what happened to Manasseh? In his distress, he sought the favor of the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his ancestors. And when he prayed to him, the Lord was moved by his anger entreaty and listened to his plea so he brought him back to Jerusalem and to his kingdom then the then Manasseh knew that the Lord is God God's vex turned into an action which brought repentance by Manasseh and brought him closer to relationship with God you know God's anger his wrath is always drawn out of love to bring us back into a relationship with him that's how it is. And in this, God foreshadows the exile. What he does to Manasseh, he's foreshadowing what's going to happen to the nation of Judah when they have to go into Babylon. But could you blame him? You know, again, 300 years. And I talked to people about the story, especially the last four or five chapters. You know, and the common comment is this. The disobedience of mankind. God gives mankind certain things, and, and, and mankind makes, you know, goes off with it. But God's patience with his people is a common denominator. So my question is, what irritates you? As a human being, I, I really, to be honest with you, have a short fuse. I wouldn't be able to stand 300 years of being vexed. It takes me literally three minutes. You know, it's getting better. You know, I'd have to say that if I were to talk about last week in my own life, a U-turn I made in my own life, the road I was going down was a road of anger. You know, that was kind of who I was. You know, I would often turn to my angry ways, and I needed to make a U-turn in that life, and God gave me authorization to make a U-turn in that life of anger. In fact, my wife knows that even today when I get angry, I start cleaning house. No, I mean, no, no, after this U-turn, you know, I literally clean the house. You know, any mess, if I am angry or vexed, I will start banging dishes while I'm doing the dishes, and literally I will speed clean the house, and my wife knows just to stay out of my way. You know, you know I'm getting better. You know, as a dog owner, I've struggled, you know, but, you know, with my new dog, Caesar, you know, he's probably our best dog yet and maybe it's part and parcel to my my ability now to control my anger when it comes to it but you know we were out for a walk uh, a couple months ago and and uh, you know our dog was a really good off-leash dog you know he'd come back at my command and you know, but there's one time he was enticed off by a little animal called the porcupine and that vexed my anger a little bit but you know what, I looked at the dog, and I had compassion on him because there was about 200 quills sticking out of every part of his face, including the roof of his mouth. Now, financially, it took a toll on our family, you know, to tune about $1,200 once the vet was all done after three hours of surgery. Um, but I looked at the dog, and I didn't have anger. I had compassion. Now, I was angry, but I had compassion. And I wonder if that's sometimes how God looks at us and says, I can't believe you did this. But because you've done this, I will have compassion on you. We have a fence. And just like, um, you know, God gives us these rules. He says, here's the boundaries of the life that I want you to live. And in the backyard, we have this fence. And we say to our dog, and I don't know if he understands English or not, but we say, you have this fence that you can live within. If you go outside of the fence, we'll have to bring discipline to you. And, you know, the dog is sometimes enticed to the other side of the fence. Now he's a big dog, and he can leap the fence pretty decently well. And so that freedom is kind of gone a little bit now because we know that that happens. So, so what we've done is we've actually, I'll go ahead and grab it right now, we've purchased this item. This, this, I don't know if you've seen these or not. This is a dog training collar, and you kind of wrap it around his neck. And, and there's kind of three um, types of things it does. It makes a sound or, a, 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 you know, a beep. And it kind of warns the dog that he's going outside of his territory or outside of his limits of, of obedience. And the next would be a vibration. You could press a button and it'll vibrate. It'll warn him again. Oh, yeah, I shouldn't be doing this. And then if he still does it, there's a shock that comes 
to him and he goes, oh, I'm doing something I shouldn't be doing. You know, and in, in life, you know, I think maybe sometimes that's what God is trying to do with us. As you read through the story, you begin to see that there's two, again, chapter, or two books of the Bible that, that the story is drawing from. The book of Kings and the book of Chronicles. And I remember explaining to you a couple weeks ago that Kings was written just as they've gone into exile and telling about how they got to this place. And Chronicles is, is near the end of the exile when they begin to understand some things a little bit differently. You know, as a child, you know, I think one of the ways that I was disciplined, you know, you know back in the 80s, there was the physical discipline. My parents weren't too bad at that. But the, 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 sometimes the, the epitome of discipline was this. You remember this one? Go to your room. Remember that one? Go to your room. Now, I mean, it's, we send kids to their rooms nowadays. They've got everything to do in their rooms. But, you know, go to your room back in the 80s really meant go to exile. Go to that place where you have nothing to do. You know, in Kings, it's written as, as if you're being sent to your room. And you know what it's like when you got to your room, you sat in your room, and you thought about it, and you go, oh, man, I wish I wouldn't have done that. And then you begin to think of apologies and think about ways you can come back and begin to come back into relationship with your parents and how you're going to say sorry. Well, Chronicles is written like you've been sitting in your room for the last two hours, you know, and you've been thinking about it. So 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verse 16 says these words. But they mocked God's messengers, despised his words, and scoffed his prophets until the wrath of the Lord was, listen this, aroused against his people. And there was no remedy. Again, there was no remedy. And this word aroused, again, I talked about in Kings, it used the word vexed. In Chronicles, it uses a different word altogether for aroused. It uses this word called Allah. And Allah is more of a linear word. You know, instead of in kings, it was cost, it was aroused to or vexed. This is a linear line. And this is the way I, you know, I, I see it. And because I think I arouse God's anger quite a bit in life. That's what I do as a human being. You know, I try not to arouse God's anger, but, you know, as a child, this is the way I saw it, you know, before I became a believer in Jesus. As a kid, I would see some of the consequences of my actions as brought on by God. You know, a little example, if I stubbed my toe, it was because I felt God was getting back at me. You know, I felt he was, he was throwing down his anger, and I stubbed my toe because potentially early in the day I might have lied or said, said something I shouldn't have done earlier. In my teenage years, as I grew up, I began to see God as someone that was always waiting to pounce on me. You know, when I failed, you know what, you know what I'm talking about, right? Sometimes we feel that way, that God is just waiting for me to fail. And then there's the whole hellfire and brimstone message. Now, I must say, I, I've, I've held off sometimes of, of, of using the hellfire and brimstone message because I, I agree, and, but I don't fully agree in some of the tactics that people have used with the hellfire and brimstone. You know, God's anger is always there. It's something that's always possible. And sin is the thing that angers God. The things we do that go against God is sin, and, and it disappoints him. And I talked a few way, weeks ago about the things we do disappoint God. But God is never disappointed in us. And in the Old Testament, as you read through it, especially going back to Leviticus, offerings are the things that staved off God's anger. If you sinned, you provided a sin offering, and it held back God's anger. And then Josiah, and I want you to really read in and, and delve into Josiah's story. Josiah finds the book of the law in 2 Kings chapter 22, verse 13, and, and, and begin to see, oh my goodness, the things that we have been doing have, have brought God's anger upon us. And again, in the Old Testament, if you sin, here's what you need to do. You need to provide an offering. And then Josiah learns this, and he does everything right. 2 Kings chapter 23 verse 26 to 27. 2 Kings 23, verse 26 to 27. After Josiah did everything right, nevertheless, the Lord did not turn away his he heat and his fierce anger, which burned against Judah because all that Manasseh had done to arouse his anger. So the Lord said, I will remove Judah also from my presence as I removed Israel. 
and I will reject Jerusalem, the city I chose, and this temple about which I said my name shall be there. Again, I, I don't know how you see God. And at the start of this message, I really wanted to get to the idea that I don't really understand God's anger. I don't really understand God's wrath. But as I read through it, and I began to see the difference between the word vexed, which again, as we go into our exile or begin, you know, are sent to our rooms, you know, our parents send us to the rooms with this vexed, like the consequence needs an action or the action that needs a consequence, you know. And for, for the Israelites, that's what needed to happen. God needed to bring a consequence, and the consequence was, was the exile. And a little bit later, after sitting in your room for so long and you begin to think about it, you begin to think, oh, yeah, it was 300 years that it took for God to get to this place. God's anger was vexed in a linear way. I want to just show you a few graphs. I think Paul has a, a few things. What I, what I want to talk about here is this idea on this graph. And you look at this graph as it comes up on the video. You see this as a linear anger graph. And what's happening is that throughout, um, you, know, you know, the 300 years, God's anger is being vexed or being aroused or Allah. And then Hezekiah comes into the scene, and, and, and there's, there's the stop, you know, the first little jaunt down where God's anger is staved off. Just pause it there first. Don't go too much further, Paul. Um, God's anger is vexed. And the next line going up, you see Manasseh, and then Josiah comes in, and God's anger is kind of staved off a little bit more. But then there's this anger period, and then the exile happens. See, God's anger is in a linear way, and there's staving off of that. But 300 years, it continues. And so God sends them into exile, sends them to the room, if, if you want to think about it like that. And then there's the thought process, and God's anger is kind of diminished by the fact that they sent them off into exile. And I want to read a couple um, passages to you in a second. But what I want you to begin to see is that, you know, the exile happens. Then as we go into the story a little bit further, God's anger continues to grow and subside, grow and subside, grow and subside. Next path. And this is what God wants. God wants and desires for his anger to be subsided for good. He doesn't want to be angry with us. As a parent, I don't want to always be angry with my kids. As a pet owner, I don't always want to be angry with my dog. And the reason I bought this, this thing to give to my dog is kind of a present to him in some way, is that whenever I give it to him, I give it to him with the notion, I say, okay, listen, we're going for a walk right now, and this is a reminder to you that if you go out of line, there will be consequences. You know, as kids, the same thing happens to us. You know, we're given consequences. You know, and, and, and for, for, for human beings, when our relationship comes to Jesus, it says, God says you know, there is, there is hell as a consequence. The high, full hell, fire, and brimstone, hell is our consequence. You know, if you do not, my anger will be brought out in the idea of hell. And I will send you there. And that's always weighing over our shoulders saying, I, all right. But you know what? God's wrath, you know, there's a, there's a stemming of it, a staving off of it. And God wants this, this linear growth of his anger to be staved off. And the one way it's done is through the next image is to say God sent his one and only son. God so loved the world that he sent his son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life, a life free of the wrath of God. But we as human beings keep screwing it up. I want to read to you four verses, though, that remind me that God's anger is ever-present, but the awe-law part of it, it's a linear thing. And here's the thing, it took 300 years, and for us, check this out, Psalm 86, 15 says these words. You know, go ahead and put it up on the screen. Paul, you have Psalm 86, 15 there? You know, God's Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. Psalm 103.8, my people have committed two sins. Psalm 103, eight also talks about the slowness of anger. Exodus 35, 6-7 talks about, you know, slowness of anger. Psalm 145.8, listen to this, the Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. This training caller for my dog is the progression it's always a threat, and obedience will occur if I use that. But it's also the fact that 
Obedience will not occur if that threat is not there. Side note of all of this. You know, my dog's learning. I'm learning. You're learning. We're all learning to grow within this. Turn to the bottom of page 238 with me. Page 238. Last week, Jeremiah came, or Isaiah came into the scene. And, and this, this week, Jeremiah comes onto the scene. And he says these words. And these are the important words. This is why I want to begin to, to, to close off this message when it comes to the anger of God. Here's why God gets angry. Jeremiah speaks these words from God. And he asks, why did God get angry? He says these words. My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. The two things, they have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have built their own cisterns. Later on, Jeremiah says, although you have washed yourself with soda and use abundance of soap, the stain of your guilt is still before me. See, human beings, we think we can do it on our own. We think we can live life on our own. We think we could fix it on our own. And we try hard to do it on our own. And this is what frustrates God or vexes God or arouses God's anger. We ignore what God offers us and try to do life on our own. We try to provide for ourselves and, and forget about what is offered in our life by God. Again, we try to provide for ourselves, but we forget what is offered to us, and that's life. We start believing that things of life will save us, and that's what the Israelites had done. They, they turned to idols. They believed that they could save us, and not the one who gave us life. Again, we start believing that the things of life will save us, not the one who gave us life. That's what frustrates God. You know, the second thing I really want to say other than God's wrath is just, it's the second thing is God's wrath is satisfied in Christ. No matter where you're at in life, no matter how long you've been going down your own road and journeying alone without Christ, you know, that may be arising his anger towards you. And above all, you know, the hell is weighing over each one of us. But again, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's the gift. What arouses God's anger is when you don't accept the gift. When you want to do life on your own. See, Judah was in a grave spot. 300 years they've been trying to do it on their own and it's aroused God's anger and his wrath and he says you know what go to your room or go to Babylon and think about what you've done and they lose their life they, they literally lose their life and for seven years they go off in exile and one entire generation passes away and and almost like you know, everything at that point is dead. They've, they've been swallowed up by the Babylonian Empire. Like I talked last week about the Assyrians and that nation, the Babylonians are even greater. And their goal here is that when they bring nations into their land, they want to kind of amalgamate them and make them stop. And you'll see that over the next couple of chapters, what happens in the exile. And in the exile, there is another prophet. His name is Ezekiel. And as I close off this message, I want to read the words of Ezekiel, like I did last week with Isaiah and the suffering servant. I want to allow you to read these words because these are powerful words that remind us that God's wrath is satisfied in Christ. Bottom of 246, the third last paragraph, about halfway down the page, I want you to almost highlight this passage. The hand of the Lord was on me. And he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of, middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? He's talking about those in exile. And I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says of, to these bones. I will make breath enter you, and you will come to life. 
I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied and I commanded. And as I, I pro- was prophesying, there was a noise, rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked and tendons and flesh appeared on them and, and skin, skin covered them. And there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come breath from four winds and breathe into this slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded and and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say, our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore, prophesy to them. This is what the sovereign Lord said. My people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. The promise. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and bring you up from them, I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in my own land. Then you will know that the Lord has spoken, and I have done it, declares the Lord. I don't know where you're at right now. I don't know, you know, even in this moment, even though you're not here physically in this room right now, God's anger can be subsided. You know, it's interesting that God says that the two things that frustrate me the most is, is this, they have forsaken me. Do you remember the last words of Jesus? God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God had to forsake Jesus because we forsook him. And in doing so, Jesus allowed the wrath of God to be subsided. Only this. He has provided for you and he wants you to trust in him. The only way God's wrath can be subsided, can be, can be staved off for good, is through the cross. That's all he wants. You know, the only thing he wants from you is to trust that he will provide for you. Stop depending on your own abilities when it comes to relationships. Stop depending on your own abilities when it comes to finances, when it comes to health, when it comes to relationships, when it comes to your education, your lifestyle, your fears, your sadness. God wants to provide for you, and he wants you to trust him. As the worship team comes up, you know, the main thing about the book of Ezekiel and the story of Ezekiel is that God sees a victory. God sees that there is a hope and a future for mankind. That there is something beyond his anger. And that even though sending them off into exile is, is like sending you know, them to the room, he knows that it will bring them closer to him through it. And he knows that in the end, the only way for us to have that same understanding of a relationship is by sending his son to the cross. That's how he dealt with his wrath once and for all. And he wants you to know that he's provided for you the cross. He's provided for you Jesus, the living water. Don't forsake him anymore. Accept him. Accept him because he wants to provide for you in this. He wants to provide for you in your relationships. He wants to provide for you in your finances. He wants to provide for you in your health and your relationships and who you are, your fears and your sadness. You want to arouse God's anger? Don't trust him. Don't trust him. But if you want to stifle God's anger, if you want to be not part of your life, trust him and in that he does see a victory and the victory is brought through the cross let's sing this one last song as we go from this place Where the 
started this message off with the idea of a frame story and you know you know and, and even in the story of Forrest Gump there was there was more beyond that story and that continues the story and the continuation of the story of exile is this and that God continues to work with his people and they come back into relationship with him and for you the end of the story is not where you're at right now the end of the story is where you finish 
You know, the, the, the finish line is salvation and the cross. But there's so much more beyond that, too. An eternity of life with Christ. So in this moment right now, I don't know where you're at. And, you know, if you're afraid of the anger of God or not, whatever that looks like for you, the acceptance of Jesus Christ is the primary thing you need to worry about. That's all he wants. Let me pray for you as we go from this place. Father, God, I pray for each person that is listening right now, God, and just even that recommitment to you right now to say, God, I understand some things, but I don't fully understand you all the time. But what I do understand is this, is that I am a broken human being, that I screw up all the time. And God, I'm, I'm passing by U-turns all the time, and I'm going down the road that I shouldn't be going down, God. And I pray right now that you allow me to make this one U-turn to say, God, I'm done going down that road. I'm done making you angry. So God, I'm not forsaking you any longer what you've given me. I'm going to accept the promise that if I accept Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, I will have life and I will stifle your anger for good because of the cross. That I'll be like the valley of dry bones and I'll, I will become life again because you give it to me through Jesus. So God, I am sorry that I'm a broken human being and I pray that you allow me to make this U-turn in my life right now to give my life over to you, to accept you as my personal Savior, to live a life that reminds me that you are God and I am not. And to go this direction from this point on in this frame story, in my story right now, that the story beyond this point is a life with you and life with you only. That I'm not depending on my own desires and goals, but yours. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Again, if you've prayed that prayer, I'd love for you to connect. We've, we have great opportunities to do that. Do that. Just email me, whatever that looks like, or Facebook. Thanks for listening today. Thanks for being part. And you know what? Two Sundays from now, you get to be in this place, and I'm looking forward to that, 50% capacity. So thanks for joining us. Ted Britton's on next week with Chapter 18. I look forward to seeing how Chapter 17 shapes your life. But as you go from this place, may the Lord bless you, and may the Lord keep you, and may the Lord's face shine upon you and give you strength. Bye for now.